I'm here actually to tell you about why I think that we haven't made the progress that we need to be playing and how I think we're changing that. You're changing that. I think the DOD breast cancer program is changing that, but we do still have a lot of work to go. So as you've already heard, you know, metastasis is the big problem in death from breast cancer. Uh, now, it's very, very complicated because many processes are involved in this uh, ugly process of tumor cells moving from the primary tumor to the uh, distant site. But as Pat mentioned, getting there is not enough. If they get to the liver or the bones or the lung or the brain and they do nothing, they're not going to be a problem, right? And what's very interesting in breast cancer is because although you can remove the primary tumor quite effectively now with surgical techniques at the primary site, metastases arise sometimes decades later, for certain years later, right? And so this uh, brings us to the question of what are those cancer cells doing? If there's no recurrence at the local site, then these cells that eventually give rise to metastases must have spread or disseminated before the disease was diagnosed and surgically handled. And so these cells are here in, I'm showing here just in the bloodstream as circulating cells, but of course they're uh, lodged in the uh, parenchyma of different organs, and it is their, uh, uh, the process of outgrowing or growing out at some random point, or so seemingly random point because we just don't understand it, that eventually will give rise to metastasis. And that's what we think we have a really nice window to prevent. It's very difficult to think about preventing something if it happens before you're diagnosed. Uh, unless it's primary prevention, and that's what Keith's talked about. So I think the focus of the Artemis projects on these two areas, primary prevention and prevention of uh, metastases arising, are really key. So I, I, I think we're in the right um, uh, focus there. Now, so the process by which these cancer cells eventually arise in a distant organ uh, is very, very poorly studied. We know very, very little about this. And that's in part because it's very difficult to study something you can't see. And so we are terming this um, period of time from which cancer cells have presumably disseminated from the primary tumor before they grow out to a clinically detectable metastasis, uh, usually at around uh, the limit of detection now with current imaging uh, methods is around half a centimeter to a centimeter in size. This is a period of dormancy. Now, I'm referring to this simply as clinical dormancy, meaning that it appears not to be, nothing appears to be happening. These, these uh, cancerous lesions appear to be sleeping. Uh, however, we actually don't know that. We don't know if they're actually uh, still growing. Uh, clearly, they're alive. But are they growing? Are they proliferating? Are they being held in check by the immune system? And so they are not able to really establish their footing and grow out to a, um, a clinically detectable metastasis. Uh, shown here as just a, an example CT of um, breast cancer metastases in the liver. So we know there have been attempts to block metastasis. That's the whole point of adjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant hormone modulating therapy or Herceptin that's given after the, sur the surgery has happened. Uh, and, and yet you don't know if there are disseminated cells, and so we use markers such as the grade, the stage, et cetera, of disease to uh, guess whether there might be metastatic cells in the body, and that's why people get chemotherapy, et cetera, after surgery, even though you don't know that the cancer cells are there. And so the whole point of that is to um, kill anything that may have already disseminated. Now, um, chemotherapy works. Uh, if you look at survival data before we started giving chemotherapy for breast cancer, it is much worse than it is today. But it comes with uh, incredible um, side effects. And uh, in fact, um, right now, it, as it stands, 10 women are treated with adjuvant chemotherapy for the benefit of three. So seven out of 10 women that chemo get chemotherapy get it because we don't know how to predict who needs it and who doesn't need it. Okay, so this is unacceptable. It's a huge, huge overtreatment problem. Now, of course, with the advent of a few tox uh, targeted therapies, such as hormone modulating therapies and Herceptin, uh, these types of therapies, because they're designed to hit a particular target, 
uh, are usually less toxic and potentially they could be more effective, but the problem is you have to know the target, right? So we know about Herceptin, we know about the estrogen receptor, what else is there to know? And so I think that was the, the large hope that came out of sequencing efforts. Uh, so I want to focus uh, for the purposes of this talk on this problem of dormancy because that's where the Artemis uh, project has, has really identified, I think, a, a nice window of opportunity. So if we can um, accept the fact that the, in some breast cancer patients, about 30% of them, uh, we have had already dissemination of cancer cells to other parts in the body. We can't see them. We can't detect them. We don't know, even know who has them. Uh, but, you know, we can ask the question about whether a functional immune system keeps t these tumor cells in check. And Keith alluded to potential therapeutic vaccines that might be able to uh, alert the immune system so that we can kill these cells before they ever are uh, growing out and causing problems. In order to, uh, so that's one focus of the Artemis project, uh, and the other is really revolving around understanding the biology of metastatic outgrowth. So when you think about the question of what's going to dictate whether or not these cancer cells get their footing and grow out to be a uh, troublesome metastasis, there's biology going on in those cancer cells themselves different metabolism, is it, a, is it a balance of uh, stopping cell death and promoting more proliferation, et cetera. But there's also um, the component of the niche, the environment. So what is it that happens in the bone or in the liver that uh, may actually uh, switch this from being an environment in which these cancer cells are uh, not, not quite comfortable, they can live but they're not uh, actively growing, to being able now to grow. So we need to understand that, I think, in order to tackle this process. Now, there's a real issue of, of tumor heterogeneity, and I'm going to come back to this because I think our sequencing efforts, for which we all had so much hope, have actually told us now that this is not uh, necessarily the, the it, there is no magic bullet. So everyone's tumor is different. And so when we, we realized this in, in the TCGA project, which I'll talk about in a second, so uh, there are so many ways genetically uh, that a breast tumor can arise. So do we have the same problem in metastasis? Are there a hundred ways that a breast tumor cell that's lodged in some distant site can figure out how to grow? Uh, or are there only a few ways? And so uh, we really need to understand more about that biology in order to do something about it. So I'm going to move now to um, the TCGA. So I, do I have this here? Oh, here we go. I'm going to come back to the next, the previous slide. So uh, as you know, uh, there was about uh, $275 million that was um, spent by the NIH to study all kinds of different cancers. Uh, this was a huge sequencing project because we thought if we could understand what are the genetic alterations in cancer, we can understand not only how it arises, but potentially how it progresses. We would identify new targets of therapy um, and, and that would be the answer. It wasn't that simple, of course. But what did it teach us about breast cancer? I don't want to stand up here and say that it taught us nothing about breast cancer because it was an important study to do. But unfortunately, what we learned um, was that there was, we had already learned most of what we needed to learn <laughs> in terms of sequencing breast cancers. So we found uh, that you know, there were mutations in a few genes that occurred at, you know, more than t in more than 10% of breast tumors, common mutations, so to speak. Um, but these were genes we already knew about, right? These are P53, PI3 kinase, uh, GATA3, et cetera, ARID3A. And, um, you know, but what we really learned was that there was no magic bullet. So there were hundreds of other mutations that occur at less than 1% frequency. So when you consider the combination of the, that kind of genetic variation in each person's tumor, you realize that there's not a magic bullet. There's not a, a particular target that's going to jump out as another HER2 or another estrogen receptor. In addition to understanding the, the terrible heterogeneity of tumors, we also uh, don't actually know of all those mutations. Let's say someone's individual tumor has 30 or 40 mutations, which was around average. 
uh, you don't know which ones are actually driving that tumor and which are just passengers, just accidental mutations that aren't actually doing anything. Furthermore, of the mutations that you can see, you don't know which of them are going to actually be detrimental to that gene or protein function. Uh, in many cases, you can, you can predict, yes, there will be an amino acid change in the protein, but you don't know if that really uh, is driving the cancer. And furthermore, we don't have corresponding therapies for most of them. And in many cases, we don't even know how to generate a therapy because it's not an enzyme, it's not a kinase or something like that. So the bottom line is that every tumor is different. And, you know, in hindsight, 2020, uh, this really explains why we've had such a hard time in, um, in developing new therapies for breast cancer. There's incredible uh, var variation in response to therapy, which is why many people are getting, you know, multiple lines of therapy, as, as Pat showed, especially in the metastatic setting. Um, and it also explains why we can't figure out whose tumor is going to recur as a metastasis and why we have this problem of overtreatment. In, in chemotherapy. So if I go back now um, to the idea of, you know, are we going to have to treat every tumor and every individual differently? Because everybody's tumor is different. Then this is the concept, I think, that uh, of precision medicine that was a huge theme at AACR this year, along with immunotherapy. I mean, these were the two uh, major themes of AACR. But when we think about it in breast cancer, I mean, uh, you know, the, some form of precision medicine has been already carried out for decades. Uh, in other words, each person's tumor is examined for histology markers and invasion, um, immunohistochemistry for ER, PR, HER2. So everybody's tumor gets characterized, and then the therapy is based on those results. Uh, we also, of course, um, uh, look at high-risk families for different mutations and consider prophylactic treatment. So in, to some degree, therapy has been personalized. So what's really new? What's new is this concept of pharmacogenomics. So can we sequence someone's tumor and then try to understand from that uh, what the best therapy should be? So the examples in breast cancer, you know, we know in families or young women with uh, family history of breast cancer, they may have BRCA mutations, and we know now that those particular tumors might be more susceptible to treatment with PARP inhibitors. So that's, that's one other concept of sort of a precision medicine. In addition, something uh, like a tumor that has a, a mutation in PI3 kinase for which there is a drug, th that's the population of patients who would be more predicted to respond to PI3 kinase inhibitors, and that's how these trials are, are done currently. So if I go, let's see back, my slides are not quite in the right order here. Okay. But this is the challenge. How does precision medicine actually apply to metastatic breast cancer? Does it do any good to sequence your primary tumor, knowing that it's going to be surgically removed and knowing how heterogeneous it is? Do we actually have any indication that the metastasis that is going to grow out to be a problem has the, those same mutations? Right? So I think it's a huge issue that has been really overlooked in the field. We often are doing things, I think, because we can. We get primary tumors. We, we can sequence them. There's lots of tissue available. We can say something about that tumor. But we're not getting at the million-dollar question, which is, what is going to grow out? What about the cells I can't see? Right? And so we have to do the important experiment, not the experiment that is because we can do it. And so do we need to think about more often biopsying these metastases, and is that what we sequence? Now, not all metastases will be able to be biopsied, uh, and so that's been a, a really big problem. We don't always have access to tissue. Uh, but one of the things that did come out of AACR that I wanted to alert you to uh, was a really exciting study that actually is several years in the making, but the latest paper, which was just published a couple months ago uh, in Science Translational Medicine, I think shows a huge promise for this problem. And what that is, is that, um, you know, we, if you've got um, metastatic cancer cells in the body, we, we can't detect them by imaging, there's not an actual measurable tumor. But there are circulating tumor cells in the, in the blood. Uh, and even more importantly, there is circulating tumor DNA. And this is actually now with the advent of more and more uh, improved sequencing technology, you can pick these up. 
And so um, if you pick up circulating tumor DNA and you compare it to normal blood DNA, you can find what are the mutations that exist somewhere in your body. You don't know where they, where they are, where they're coming from, but they exist. And you can actually now detect, um, you can detect, of course, normal DNA. You can detect uh, chromosomal translocations, amplifications, such as HER2, uh, deletions in, um, in the chromatin, loss of arms or gains of chromosomal arms. So now what this does is it, it, I think it gives us a very, very sensitive picture of what's going on in the body, even in the absence of a tumor mass. And in fact, the study has, has shown now that the uh, sensitivity and specificity of this um, in, in people who have cancer uh, is around 87% 80 sensitivity, meaning you're going to miss 13%, unfortunately, still at this time, uh, because again, the detection of these types of um, abnormal DNA are going to depend on how deeply you can sequence, and if they're, if they're there at 0.05% uh, of the DNA that's in your bloodstream, you're, you might miss it. So that's why the sensitivity is still somewhat low and needs to be improved but a 99% specificity, meaning that if you get one of these signals, it's real. And so now we can start thinking about things that uh, are not only are there tar targetable uh, mutations present in the bloodstream even though we can't see the metastasis, uh, but um, you know, for example, it, there might be a mutation for which we have, you know, we have around 100 uh, therapies for different kinds of cancer mutations, and maybe one of those would be match up with the with the sequence and could could potentially be used. Um, but maybe even more importantly, this could give us a window into what's going on in the genome of these disseminated cells for which to design vaccines. And I really, honestly, think that this is going to be uh, that where we're going to make the most progress. And I think that the synergy between the two Artemis projects here is going to really do it. I think, you know, I, I believe in this uh, deadline campaign, and I really do think we can know how to do this by 2020. So with that, I'm going to um, just really um, quickly summarize a little bit on the pro uh, progress based on this Artemis projects. Uh, and that is that we, we now do know the mutational landscape of breast cancer, primary breast cancer. There's no magic bullet, but I don't think that is the question that we need to be asking in the, con in the uh, spectrum of uh, how do we present or prevent metastasis. We think now that circulating tumor D DNA can perhaps be used as a surrogate for metastatic burden. You could imagine being able to use this, and the authors of that study have proposed to use this as a way to detect residual disease after surgery, for example. And I'm thinking about it in a completely different way, which is, you know, can we use that to develop vaccines to try to kill these uh, cells from which this DNA uh, arises? Uh, and then we do, I didn't talk about um, any of my own work here, but we do have model systems now in which to study this. So maybe doing the sequencing isn't enough, even if that's on the metastatic uh, lesion, because there is heterogeneity. There's going to be, you know, other uh, metastatic lesions that have different sequences, et cetera. Um, so maybe we need to also move uh, toward testing gene function in addition to mutations, right? So which are the key ones? Which are the ones that those metastatic cancer cells are really, really dependent on? And I think we do have the models now in which to, to study that. So, um, and, and you could even uh, envision, and we're starting this now, is to test these therapies in these models in a co-clinical setting type thing. So we can actually have patient cells growing at the same time as a patient is undergoing treatment and try to use those models to predict uh, the best therapy. So with that, I just want to say thank you uh, for all you do. You, you may not even know how much difference you make to the scientific community, but your leadership is really key in driving, forcing scientists to not do what they can do, but do what they should do. And by starting with that big question, that is, uh, that's going to be the key to the deadline and the key to uh, ending breast cancer.